Welcome everybody and thank you for joining uh, this event. I am really very excited to be here and a little bit nervous because this event is the result of six weeks of really hard work and of a couple of more months before then of, of planning uh, for this program that, that I am thrilled to be a part of. This is the Responsible AI Summer Research Program. And today we will be doing a showcase of the research projects that uh, everybody worked on. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so today we, I will first start by giving a quick overview, just a couple of minutes of uh, what this program is, why uh, we put it together. Uh, and uh, the first thing to say is that this program is a collaboration between the Center for Responsible AI that I direct uh, at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering and Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, and we set up this program because uh, we want to do what we can to make sure that uh, there is some benefit that we can derive from the terrible situation and the terrible aggression of Russia against Ukraine. And so let's, let's view this as a kind of a silver lining. Uh, our goals here really are in the short term to make sure that all of you students at, at uh, Ukrainian universities, mostly UCU, but also others, have an opportunity to continue with your studies and to do research uh, on the topic of responsible AI. And in the long term, I hope that this program will lead to a collaboration uh, between NYU and UCU, as well as other academic structures uh, in the United States and uh, in Ukraine. Next slide, please. So I had the pleasure of organizing this. Uh, my name is Julia Stojanovich. I am on the faculty at NYU affiliated with two units. One of them is the computer science and engineering department at the Tendon School of Engineering. And my other unit is the Center for, uh, sorry, is the Center for Data Science at also at New York University. And I also direct the Center for Responsible AI here. So this program is one of the activities of the Center for Responsible AI. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to now hand over to Yaroslav, uh, who's been an, of immense help in, in planning this. So please say a couple of words, Yaroslav. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Yulia, for giving me the floor. Uh, I'm very happy uh, we are here today and we have this opportunity uh, to talk about at least short-run results of, uh, of this initiative uh, Yulia uh, initiated several months ago. Uh, just a few words about us, uh, about uh, Ukraine and Lviv, uh, where we reside. Uh, and I, I would like to start uh, with uh, some historical uh, background. Uh, so we, today we talk about data science projects and uh, at least several uh, important concepts uh, and important features for data science uh, came from Lviv. Uh, first of all, uh, you can't do data science without coffee. And coffee, first coffee shop, was uh, established in Lviv by Yuri Kulchitsky. So we are very famous about that. And if you uh, once come to Lviv, please try our coffee. Another important topic for data science, an uh, important concept, is fixed point theorem. This fixed point theorem was invented uh, by Stefan Banach, uh, who represents Lviv Mathematical School who was probably one of the most famous or the most famous uh, mathematical school in between first and second world war. And that concept that you probably are also familiar with is Monte Carlo method uh, that was invented by Stanislav Ulam, also representative of Lviv mathematical school, but he did that after he was invited by uh, John von Neyman who visited Lviv twice to invite Stanislav Ulam to Los Alamos National Laboratory. And the story is that during, uh, when one of them stayed in the hospital and another one uh, visited him, they invented that Monte Carlo method uh, during their discussion. And this historical uh, parallels uh, are very clear, shows me uh, to, uh, today's uh, uh, today's situation, because 
uh, for me, Yulia Stojanovic is that John von Neyman in old days who uh, reached out uh, me personally uh, through our friend uh, and invited us to, uh, to do something to help uh, Ukrainian students uh, during these hard times. Uh, thanks to internet, thanks to the online uh, collaboration, we shouldn't just move to the United States to do science, to do collaboration. Now we can do this online. And thank, thanks to, to these opportunities, thanks to Yulia, we are, uh, we, today we, we can uh, see the results of these research internships. And also uh, we, can, we are proud to have many Ukrainian students taking online courses from Tendon uh, online summer semester. Uh, also, thanks to Yula and her colleagues uh, and Tender School of Engineering. And I, I hope this is just a start of broader collaboration between uh, Tendon School of Engineering and Faculty of Applied Sciences and other universities in Ukraine. So war came to uh, Ukraine and the millions I need. And uh, to help millions, one needs to help somebody. And uh, I would like to thank uh, New York University, Tandon School of Engineering, Center for Responsible AI community to being with us in these dark times. And I'm sure better times uh, will come soon and we'll celebrate the victory of good very soon. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, for for doing that for us. Slava Ukraini, and thank the United States. Thank you very much, Yaroslav. And uh, again, I couldn't be happier and prouder that we're able to to collaborate. Uh, and I'm quite sure that that good will prevail. I mean, this is one of these situations where it's very clear uh, where the boundary is between good yeah. and evil, and it's rare that that, that happens. Um, Thank you very much, Julia. <laughs> so uh, let me continue just a, a little bit before we dive into the project presentations. Uh, this program could not have been possible without the amazing mentors uh, who drove the work on these projects. So I would like to start by thanking the faculty mentors who are presented on uh, this slide. And you can see that not all of them are from New York University. We have Bill Howe from the University of Washington, Damon McCoy, who is my colleague at NYU, Leonid Lipkin uh, from the University of Edinburgh, Josh Loftus from the London School of Economics, and Sebastian Shelter from the University of Amsterdam. And most of them are on, on this uh, call today. Uh, next slide, please. And the real work, of course, was done by the graduate student mentors who have worked very closely with the summer fellows. And I'm listing them on this slide here. Uh, here we have Bernice Herman from the University of Washington, Paula Arifkan from NYU, Ian Solano Kamaiko from NYU, Laura Edelson from NYU, Lucas Rosenblatt from NYU, Lucius Bynum, also NYU, Shuba Guha from the University of Amsterdam, and Tobias Lawinger from NYU. Uh, thank you, all of you, for, for your contributions. Uh, and I think that we all have learned a lot from this opportunity, and I'm hoping also that we will have lots of actual uh, publications come out of this in addition to all the learning. Uh, so let's look at the next slide. One of the components of this program was a set of tutorials uh, that we offered to the fellows. And I would like to thank everybody who uh, delivered these tutorials. You already heard all of their names because they were also mentors in this program. One additional person is Chloe Bacalar, who is a responsible AI researcher at Meta, and she gave a couple of tutorials as well. Uh, there's a list of uh, tutorials on, on the right of the slide, and you can see that they cover a variety of responsible AI topics. Next slide, please. So at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce the first team. Uh, fellows will present their work. Please uh, keep to a 10 minute time limit, uh, and we will have a brief, maybe, two minute Q&A after each presentation. And then we will hopefully have time also for a longer question and answer session at the end of the presentations. So uh, please, demographic data quality is the first team. Hello everyone. Uh, we are the team who worked on the demographic data quality. 
Uh, can you please move to the next slide? I'm sorry, please say your names. I forgot to uh, to, to introduce you. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I am Alina, and my colleagues are Taras and Yuri, and we will present our, what we have done in these six weeks, our results and our insights that we have. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the uh, next, next slide, please? <laughs> So the problem statement is that nowadays many important decision-making processes are influenced by the machine learning models. And there are more and more processes that are overtaken by machines, not by people. And therefore, therefore uh, these are, there are machines who need to make the decisions and the machines who need to abide by some data policies and certain regulations. And it is important to account for risks that might arise regarding data policies and fairness towards different categories especially when we deal with demographic data. Next slide, please. Uh, so the aim of our project is to analyze demographic data and define factors that influence the dirtiness of the data in terms of different categories of people that are in the data set. And we want to understand which categories of people are mostly affected by the quality issues and which of them are mostly discriminated, so to say. Next slide, please. So the last six days can be split up into four main uh, parts. Uh, our first task was to define and implement some tools that will help us to find the dirtiness in the data sets. Then we had to uh, find specific demographic data sets our analysis will be applied on. Uh, then we had to construct an automatic mechanism that will receive the data set as an input and will uh, output its analysis. Uh, that for further studies. And finally, we had to uh, apply all this on our, uh, we had to put all this together and visualize our results. Uh, next please. slide, please. Yes, next one. So speaking about the data that we chose for our research, I would like to mention that we managed to, found, to find seven different data sets. The first two ones, uh, which are called adult data and full data, they contain information from the US census database. Uh, cardio and COVID data are the data sets which describe people who suffer from cardiovascular diseases and COVID respectively. And it's, it's, it's important that that data was collected in Europe, so we have some non-US centric data sets in our research. Speaking about the NYPD or New York Police Department uh, data, it represents different cases uh, where the police was involved during the year uh, 2020 in New York. And the credit data is provided by different banks in the US and it contains information about people who decided to take a loan and uh, the last data set contains information about students and their achievements when we talk about dirtiness of the data sets we define some error types those are five of them that we have the first one is missing values this is simply when we have the null values stored in the cell the outliers which are the extreme numerical values the duplicates in the data set which are simply the duplicate rows the inconsistencies, uh, these error types occurs when there are two cells in a column that have different values, but they need to have the same value. For example, if we have the, the state name California and the state code CA, those are labeled as inconsistency because those are actually like the same thing, but they are written in not the same way. And the next error type is mislabels. It's an incorrectly labeled example in the data set. And we have several techniques uh, of, by which we detect those errors. For missing values, we sim simply seek for empty entries in the data set. For outliers, we have three techniques. Those are the sigma rule with the standard deviation, uh, the interquartile range, and the isolation forest approach. Uh, for duplicates, we search for key collision because it's the fastest method that uh, we can use. Uh, for inconsistencies, we use the k-means text clustering, and for mislabels, we use the clean lab package that is like the open source package available on the internet. So because we had a lot of information, we had to group it somehow. So uh, we decided to define three hypotheses according to the uh, types of data the analysis will be based on. So uh, these types are the sex, age, and race data. So we simply uh, take the data set, uh, slice it into two parts with respect to the privilege value and each value is uh, chosen uh, for each data type uh, specifically. So for example, we have the data set split into uh, 
uh, first part where male is the pre-wish value and the second part where anything else like female or any other values uh, are contained. And then the analysis for the uh, ratio of the rows with dirtiness with specific uh, uh, specific dirtiness types was defined. Uh, so let's go to the first type. And this is the uh, sex data. Uh, because we chose the uh, male as the privilege value, we thought that the uh, dirtiness uh, uh, amount in the unprivileged values will be bigger. And it is partly uh, uh, visualized here, but if you move to some another slides, uh, we can see that on some data sets like cardio data and another one, folks data, there is still uh, an unbalanced uh, factor exists, but uh, uh, data slice with uh, male uh, also contains higher ratio of uh, of dirtiness, and in this case, these are mislabels. Please move to the next slide. And one more. So, uh, as it was mentioned by Taras, we have a hypothesis that there is an unbalanced dirtiness with respect to age. So, we have generated some age clusters for every data set. I mean, uh, if the person is younger than 32 years old, we would associate them with the young cluster, and in other case, we would consider them as an adult. So, in this slide, you can see the results obtained from the adult data. You can see uh, three different types of errors, outliers, mislabels, and inconsistencies. And they were detected by three different methods. And it is obvious here that if you're an adult, uh, you have a higher chance or probability of uh, error occurring. The same thing is, uh, please, the next, the next slide. The same thing is uh, here with the COVID data. We got outliers detected by two different methods. And the percentage for adults is, slightly, is uh, significantly higher than for non-adults. And then the next one, yeah. And uh, this slide uh, represents the results from credit data. You can see the difference for adults and non-adults when you talk about outliers detected by uh, K-sigma rule and interquartile inter uh, range rule, yeah. So the final criteria uh, was the race uh, data type. Please move to the next slide. And here we can see that uh, it is also, uh, there exists an imbalance uh, factor, but here we can see that the privileged value, which is the white race, contains more dirtiness. Uh, only two data sets contained uh, only two data sets contained uh, such dirtiness, uh, but the second one was folk tables data set, but there was no uh, unbalancedness. That is why we did not include that to the presentation. And uh, here arises one of the hypotheses for uh, such results is that uh, because of the size of the data set, uh, such dirtiness occurs. Uh, interest interestingly, uh, the data sets with a higher number of observations like folk tables data uh, had less dirtiness observed uh, and found uh, in terms of our analysis. But for example, adult data, which is uh, much smaller than the folk stable data set uh, contains, uh, I guess, the greatest amount uh, of dirtiness among all of observed data sets. Please move to the summary slide. Uh, so as a result of our project, we have a notebook for full data set analysis and result visualization. Uh, we have analyzed seven data sets with seven dirtiness detection tools for five error types that we had. Uh, as a conclusion, we can say that there exists an imbalance in dirtiness between sex, age, and race clusters in some of the demographic datasets that we used. And the most common dirtiness types are outliers and mislabels, and like other dirtiness types occur less frequently in the datasets. So uh, during the last few weeks, we have developed a few ideas which we hadn't implemented yet. So we would like to use uh, other techniques to clean the data a bit more, to understand the influence of cleaning, We'd also like to evaluate, evaluate the performance of different machine learning models on both clean and dirty data and compare the obtained results to make some uh, conclusions. So that's all from us. Feel free to ask any questions concerning our project. Thank you very much. Perfect timing, 10 minutes. Questions? Yes, please, Bernice. 
Hi, great presentation. Uh, I was very happy to hear that 32 is still in the young. Uh, so a little worried for next year for me, but um, I wanted to ask about, so there, there seems like there could be two interpretations. Um, if you have a particular class, um, have, let's say, you know, more noisiness in the labels, right? So one could be that the, the data truly has more noisiness. And the other could be that the method that you are using to predict noisiness is biased mm -hmm. towards one group as opposed to the other. Have you guys thought about, um, you know, how, like, which of these apply where or, or kind of started exploring that space? Uh, if I understood your question correctly, uh, I guess we had some kind of uh, such thing uh, in terms of outliers detection because uh, one of the methods uh, defined by our uh, by, by us in the presentation was isolation forest, but it actually was not uh, included into analysis uh, for the one simple reason. Uh, it is the data structure that receives uh, as an input the uh, prior, uh, expected expected uh, percentage of outliers, and uh, that is why it its results uh, are not so uh, they are not automatic or flexible as uh, in the case of interquartile range uh, or uh, outliers. But yeah, your comment is pretty good, and I guess the good uh, approach for that is to just use several methods for the detection and just compare or take like average results of them. But uh, still it, it is complicated because not each approach uh, has uh, several ways to be, uh, to be analyzed, I don't know. Yeah, okay, thank you, this is great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next presentation and this is going to be on stability in data science pipelines by Denise and Taras. Please. Yes, thanks to you, Julia. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Taras, and uh, in cooperation with Denise, under mentorship of Paula, Julia, and Sebastian, for last uh, six weeks, we studied stability in data science pipeline. Next, please. Yes. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, we studied the effects of different preprocessing techniques on the performance of an automated decision system. In this work, we focused on scenarios where values are missing, but not at random. We believe that each kind of null, or in other words, missing value in our data has its own properties and causes, and hence must be handled properly. Yes, next slide. Yeah, and as a solution for this challenge, we created the next uh, diagram. So first step is just we load our like source data set. And here we uh, like make a copy of the data set uh, and uh, have two different data sets. As first one is baseline data set and second one is data set with nulls, uh, which uh, previous slide please. Yeah, Pre previous one. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the next one is the dataset with nulls. And uh, we created the dataset uh, with uh, null scenario simulator, which we will um, describe in the future. And uh, second step, uh, we imputed the dataset with different uh, imputation techniques. And as a result, we have a bunch of different datasets, which is imputed uh, uh, with special techniques. And next step is uh, find the best model. So we are uh, like um, tune, um, uh, train different models, um, compare them on different uh, uh, metrics and find the best uh, model and tune hyperparameters for uh, our data sets and uh, which we use for quantifying uncertainty, which is in analysis block. So um, uh, we uh, quantify uncertainty with bootstrapping method, which we describe in the future. And uh, next part, we uh, compute fairness metrics for our imputed data sets. And uh, eventually we visualize our results in plots, which we will also describe in this presentation. Next slide, please. And now we yes. are going to present our baseline data set. Uh -huh. Thanks. Now a few words about uh, baseline data set. As the primary data set, we took the data set from folk tables uh, paper, which were mentioned for several times by previous team. Um, this data set was made uh, from the US census data for all 50 states 
for years ranging from 2014 to 2018. And as you can see from the data distribution among states, four biggest states in population are uh, California, Florida, New York, and Texas. And as you may guess, we work exactly with those four. Next, please. Uh -huh. uh, we focused on uh, the part of the data set, which is called ACS employment data set. So each data set consists of at least 200,000 rows and 18 columns. One of the column is the binary target employment status, which says is the person employed or not. Uh, the rest of the features uh, contain uh, one numerical column, H, one ordinal categorical column, uh, schooling, uh, which shows the education status. Uh, the better, the higher education the person possesses. And uh, the rest of the columns are categorical. It's basically general information about the person, namely sex, race, marital status, military status, and so on. Next, please. Yes, now a few words about nulls. Next, please. I will briefly explain what we mean by null scenario. For instance, uh, the survey sheet uh, could contain only two options for marital status, married or not married. But, but in the data set, we want uh, to have a wider range of options. So the values which correspond to widowed, divorced, or separated uh, would be nulls in our data set. Um, another scenario, um, you can think of, of it as uh, imagine a person with disability. In some cases, the person may want to avoid providing the information. I am hearing someone. Jack? Yes. Yeah. It should be there in 10 minutes. 10 minutes? OK, sorry. I will continue. Um, so uh, imagine a person with disability. So in some cases, the person may want to avoid uh, providing an information about their disability. So the value in such column could be left uh, as a missing. Another null scenario is optional. For instance, if the non-binary person uh, wouldn't fill the sex uh, question since it only assumes options male or female. And uh, as you can get from the picture, there are much more, much more null scenarios which are on the slide, but um, I hope you got the idea. Next, please. Now the time came for preprocessing techniques. The most obvious two are drop row or column. And uh, as the name reveals uh, what it's doing. The next uh, imputation technique uh, are impute by more mode for categorical columns and the uh, mean or median for numerical ones. A slight improvement uh, could be uh, to it uh, first trim upper or or and lower k percent of data, and then impute with mod or median or whatever. Uh, another approach is to condition on protected groups by sex or race. For example, impute with one value for males and with another for females. And the last three techniques could be unified under the name predict. As the name suggests, we just predicted the missing values with linear or logistic regression, with SkyNN, and with neural network from DataWeek. And uh, to evaluate our imputation, we used mean absolute error for numerical columns and accuracy score for categorical one. Next, please. Now we are going to describe uh, next block of our diagram, which is called quantifying uncertainty with bootstrapping. So next slide, please. And uh, what bootstrapping actually means. So bootstrapping uh, is a method where we create an ansible of our uh, the best model with the best uh, tuned uh, hyperparameters. And um, uh, for our case, we uh, get 200 of uh, decision trees with the uh, best tuned uh, hyperparameters and give them, uh, all of them a train set, which is uh, just 80% uh, randomly uh, taken uh, samples from our 
whole train set uh, and we fitted uh, all those uh, models and we uh, tested um, our models on the same test set. So as a result, we have 200 uh, of uh, uh, predictions and based on them, we uh, compute our uh, stability, fairness and accuracy metrics. Uh, and related to stability metrics, first metric which we use is called label stability. And uh, let's look at a picture on this slide. Uh, imagine that we have uh, one the same model with the same uh, hyperparameters, uh, but we have two independent experiments. First one we use uh, in, in which we use uh, the same train set and the same test set. And after we plot our uh, results. And uh, as you can see on this picture that there is some colored dots, uh, they, um, which is uh, near to decision boundary. In uh, uh, different experiments, uh, they change their label from uh, employed to unemployed or vice versa. Uh, that's why uh, we use such uh, like metric, which is called label stability uh, to measure a number of such um, uh, dots. And if we have a great number of such dots, so it means that our model is quite unstable. And so the label stability just normalize absolute difference between the number of times a sample is classified as employed or unemployed. And uh, value of one means a perfect stability and value of zero means an extremely bad model stability. And other stability measures which we use is standard deviation, intercoastal range, um, which is quite often used. Next slide, please. Yeah, and let's go to our uh, uh, fairness metrics block. Next slide. And as fairness metrics, we uh, use the next one. Is first one is equal opportunity, which states that each group should get the positive outcome at uh, equal rates, assuming that people in this group uh, qualify for it. So, basic formula for that is uh, the formula of true positive rate, where we get. Uh, true positive divided by positive number and uh, statistical parity is the second fairness matrix which measures the difference in probabilities of a positive outcome across two groups so which is just a uh, difference of uh, probability of positive outcome for first group minus probability of positive outcome for second group next slide please and uh, let's now um, look at our insight from plot analysis next slide yeah. sorry so we're out of time, so two more minutes, and then we won't have a Q and A. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, briefly, uh, like describing our, our insight. First insight is just basic that uh, we find out that accuracy, we find out accuracy and fairness trade off. So it's just widely uh, used trade off, but we also observed uh, it on our data set. Here we like displayed metrics for all our um, imputation techniques. Uh, yes, so as you can see from this slide, on the right bottom corner, there is three dots. First one is uh, purple, other is uh, red, and other is orange. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, like techniques we show the best accuracy. Actually, this is data week. Uh, uh, second one is when we used our baseline uh, data set. And third one, when we drop our columns, since we had a huge data set, so we just can drop uh, our rows and uh, get also good result. So next slide, please. And new insight from our plot analysis is stability fairness trade-off. So uh, here we have uh, a plot uh, uh, with uh, label versus uh, label stability versus statistical parity different based on race. So here we also have our three um, three best imputation techniques. Um, which we used, uh, and uh, as we can see, they, they have also a good label stability, but the fairness uh, uh, metric is not so uh, good compared to other metrics, since uh, the distance from uh, zero level is more than for others, but others also have less model stability. Next slide, please. And yeah, related to um, our best imputation method, which you found out is a data weak imputer, which maintains accuracy and stability. You can see uh, it's marked with uh, the arrow. And also it is unexpected is that it also has uh, fairness gains since it's a distance from a zero level uh, boundary is less than compared to baseline data set. And as the techniques perform comparably, uh, pretty comparably, yeah, next slide. And yes, and also it was interesting insight that uh, which protective group you impute based on matters. So uh, in our, among our imputation techniques, we have uh, several conditional techniques. Uh, first one based on sex and the other one based on race. So we just, uh, for example, as Tras described, uh, we impute uh, for male with one mean value and for female with other mean value. And here we can see that um, uh, imputation method based uh, on con uh, conditional sex uh, showed better 
uh, results based on fairness, uh, uh, like in the standard, um, like in statistic statistically parity difference for race and also for sex and also in the intersectional between race and sex. So it actually matters based on what um, protective group you impute. And next slide. Uh, and yeah, and uh, as uh, eventually our future work is that we are going to reproduce results for other real world uh, data sets with nulls. Also try other uncertainty classification methods such as fitting a model to the residual. And also we are going to finalize our paper and submit to triple AI. Uh, next slide. Thank you for attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you. We will do questions at the end because we are actually over time. Thank you very much. Um, and now we go to the next presentation by Tatiana and Nazar, please. Hey everyone, thank you for the introductions. My name is Tatiana uh, Nazar and I work with Tatiana. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we added the slide because we are so uh, serious in, in previous and also we want to mention our mentor uh, Andrew too in the slides. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we want to start with some motivations why we want uh, to do this research. Next slide. Uh, researchers have uh, defined metrics that can be used to, to evaluate the fairness of machine learning system. Unfortunately, there are theoretical constraints showing that it's mathematically impossible to optimize multiple fairness metrics simultaneously like uh, as uh, false negative rate and false positive rate as seen on the slides. Next slide. Uh, but if you all know that theory does not always equal practice and Rodolf uh, tells some examples that it was uh, showing that one can achieve high fairness without losing accuracy in resource constrained ML for public policy settings where only a percentage of the populations is held. Next slide, please. So we have the uh, main uh, our research questions uh, that is it possible to optimize multiple fairness metrics simultaneously in resource constrained ML for public policy problem. Next slide. So let's look to our data. We used an open data set on student performance in two Portuguese schools. You can find on the slide. And we built a machine learning system to predict the risk that a high school student will fail. That is common application of ML for public uh, policy since we usually have constrained school resources to help students to succeed. So the data contains three students' grades, as you see, because uh, during the school year, students are evaluated in three periods. Our target attribute G3 is the final year grade uh, issue at the third period, while G1 and G2 correspond to the first and second period grades. Also, there are demographic, uh, social, uh, uh, school related features uh, and in total we have like 32 attributes. Next slide. So since we want to build a model that predicts the risk of failure in the early stage, we suppose that stakeholders will use it uh, just after the first semester. So we dropped uh, the second grade for sure, but for other feature, it was not so obvious. The database was built from two sources, school reports and questionnaires. And for us, it was essential just to prevent data leakage to understand when exactly they gather this information at the beginning of the year or at the end and to see the original formulation of the question. So we wrote to the person who created uh, this data set, Paulo Cortez. And I should say that even though the data set was created eight years ago, we received the answer just in a few hours. And yes, sometimes it is nice to have friends who know Portuguese. Uh, next slide. So last but not least that I would like to point out that uh, we will focus on three attributes, final grade, so G3, gender, and school. The proportion of students from these two schools is one to two, so like 35 and 65%. For both schools, we have a higher risk for males to fail, and there is a much higher failure rate for the smaller school. Next slide, please. Okay, when you know something about our data sets, we can go to the modeling part and probably about modeling pipelines. Uh, our pipelines have three steps. It's a processing steps. It was very simple for our data sets because it was uh, don't have any outliers and empty values, uh, but we only need to uh, label our data and uh, uh, encode our target value because now G3 is from zero to 
20, but we need uh, the binary classifier one or zero. Uh, the next steps is was uh, modeling parts uh, uh, when we uh, try to um, find the best model uh, using the grid search to find the best parameters of the models. We use uh, gradient boosting, logistic regressions, decisions tree, and uh, random forest. Also, we use a stratified k falls to have some uh, robust results uh, uh, of our metrics. Uh, so uh, after that, we calculated uh, the uh, metrics of each uh, uh, of our models and create uh, tables. Uh, can you next slide, please? And in this slide, you can see this uh, tables where we have the uh, model name, parameters, uh, also uh, some scores. Uh, there are only a couple of them, uh, precisions at 10 and 20%, but also we used uh, F1 at K and uh, recall at K. Uh, but it is the main we used uh, why we use uh, a precision and some percent because uh, we don't uh, need uh, all informations uh, we only need uh, the, this uh, uh, percentage of the failures and in the slides you can see that the best models uh, is a gradient boosting classifier next slide please so uh, we have a model, so we can talk about fairness. So there are a lot, a lot of bias metrics and fairness definitions. So to decide which one we should implement for our public uh, policy problem, we used an open source bias audit toolkit uh, Equitas. They have a very lovely fairness tree that helps not to lose yourself in the bunch of bias metrics. So since we want to help our students, that means that our interventions are assistive and we would uh, like not to lose people with actual needs. We focused on group size, and false negative rate for sex and school. Please next, next slide. Next. Uh, no, not uh, like one before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so for bias mitigation methods, there are several approaches too. And the problem is that all known methods only optimize a single fairness metric. But we are looking for a method that optimizes through four fairness metrics. And moreover, should keep the precision rate at a high level. Next slide, please. Okay, when you know something about uh, our fairness metrics and about our models, uh, we can go to the uh, the main parts to find the optimizations of uh, our uh, fairness metrics and the challenges that we have that how can we find a set of students that maintain high precisions but improve fairness on multiple metrics. Next slide, please. And in this slide, you can see our approach. It was genetics algorithms, why we get it, because you can uh, be very flexible and we can use it for the optimizing the different uh, problems in different area because they don't need the uh, strict constraints like nonlinear optimizations, nonlinear optimizations. It will be our next uh, steps also. And uh, uh, some words, uh, some couple of words about some algorithms. Uh, that genetic algorithms, it's uh, uh, algorithms that help us to find uh, near uh, optimal values. Uh, we uh, it was iteratively, and uh, we have the gener uh, generations of. For our example, is a twenty list of students. After that, we calculated the uh, evaluation scores for each uh, of this list. Uh, select the best reproduct across to create a new generations and added some mutations uh, for our new generations. Uh, also, what I want to add it about the gen our uh, research that we test different evaluations functions, which is very important uh, from uh, some uh, Euclidean distance, uh, uh, some harmonics mean to some customs Euclidean, for example, uh, when we added some uh, constraint because it, it isn't uh, uh, very good to have very good fairness metrics, but uh, uh, very bad uh, uh, precisions uh, for the stakeholders so that we added some uh, uh, this uh, constraints about uh, what uh, the minimum of precisions must be. Next slide, please. 
So our main results, uh, as you see, our range of resource constraints, that is what percentage of students can be helped. And you can find them on the horizontal line. We showed that there exists list of students that optimize multiple fairness metrics. Usually if the results of fairness metrics are between 0 0.8 and 1.2, we say that the model is not biased. So here you can see this fairness window as two dash lines and that with our genetic algorithm, we managed to make the decision which students to choose to choose much fairer according to school uh, and the gender and please next slide uh, so the most important part that the most precision lost uh, was only 10 percent next slide uh, and so our conclusions and further steps we made uh, important first step in showing that multiple fairness metrics can feasibly be optimized and in further research we will take the following next steps so the first one we should uh, like we want to test our approach on the different data sets. Uh, the second that we would like to, ch to check more objective functions as trade-off for the evolutionary algorithm. And so for the third, we want to apply other techniques from nonlinear programming. Next. So thank you for your attention and thank you for my best research team ever. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, we are ready. <laughs> Thank you very much. We do have two minutes for questions. Uh, and as you are presenting for other teams, I'm typing warnings into chat for you. So please watch warnings on the time that remains. So questions, please. I can ask a uh, question. Please. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about uh, the decision of uh, the fairness metrics a little more, like why, uh, I mean, sex, I think is pretty obvious, but maybe talk a little bit about school and why uh, that seems like a relevant metric and maybe uh, why group size or, uh, for example. Tanya, maybe you because you just speak about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, okay. Uh, why? Why? Uh... I just a little bit mentioned about the schools that uh, uh, we have uh, this disparity in uh, the number of students from this uh, from both like uh, one, one to two uh, as a ratio, uh, but we have uh, a really much higher failure in the smallest uh, school. So if you like try to solve this problem, like uh, to give the tutoring uh, for the first list, uh, it uh, would be very biased uh, to whom uh, to, to give support. So that's why we took uh, this uh, across like gender is really obvious and takes the school to, to give like um, equal, uh, equal equal support to, uh, to, to the students. Great, thank you. Okay. A question from Paula and quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a very quick question. So what, what is the base rate amongst populations? Maybe that's why there isn't a trade-off? Do we know? Base populations is like the list of students which predict the model with the highest score. It's the best. So this is the base of our. Uh, Paul is asking whether the base rates are comparable across subpopulations, meaning whether you have a comparable number of positive versus negative examples across sex, for example, across schools, etc. And across schools, not right. I mean, because you said yeah, already yeah. one of the yeah. schools there are uh, yeah, higher yeah, rates yeah. of failure, yeah. and among the boys there are higher rates of failure. Yeah, yeah. Was that the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So we, we can continue, of course, after uh, all the presentations. And uh, the first two teams, of course, spoke about nulls, right, as uh, a feature of the data that needs to be understood and addressed. And so the next project is going to be presented by Mikhailo and Alexander, and it speaks about SQL with nodes. Hey, right. uh, so, and next slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, can, could you please update maybe this presentation because we've edited some styles and it looks kind of ugly. <laughs> So if you, if you could start from the eight to fifth slide, right again. No, no. Okay, okay, okay. Eight to five, slide eight to five. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, uh, lots, a lot to cover. So let's start right, right away. So let, next, next slide. 
Okay, so most of you have worked uh, with SQL, I guess, uh, in some point of your life. And maybe you didn't uh, get uh, every, very deep in the, into this language and didn't understand all of its nuances and uh, features. And uh, there is one feature, though, uh, in SQL that every programmer should know about, because uh, it is how uh, SQL treats nulls. Uh, when SQL has an operation that involves nulls, uh, that uh, has nulls inside of it, it often outputs unknown because it doesn't know what null is, right? And if something, a logic operation is dependent uh, on uh, this value of null, it outputs unknown. But the problem is that unknown, not unknown, uh, is uh, still unknown, and uh, all of this is treated as false. And this leads to uh, huge bugs, and uh, SQL is actually very famous for these bugs. Many queries that you look equivalent as uh, if we are selecting uh, the values that are equal to themselves, right? And uh, they are not actually equivalent. So uh, these problems arise very often. Next slide. So another natural question is how it would work if we would try to use Boolean logic instead. So how it would work if we tried to avoid all those nulls and uh, unknown values as a consequence. And uh, if you remember queries from the previous slide, they were not equivalent under three-valid logic. Uh, but uh, actually they appear to be equivalent under Boolean logic. So uh, we get that um, if we try to use Boolean logic instead, we avoid all those problems and all those bugs uh, which were described in the previous slide. Uh, another question is uh, are there um, such, uh, okay, it's, it's okay to move to the next slide. Uh, so another question is, are there such queries which uh, work equivalent under both kinds of logics? And um, in order to get this, uh, the answer uh, on this question, you would like to find some statistics on the proportion of queries which remain invariable uh, when we try to change the logics uh, we use to uh, the query. And we'd like to calculate how many queries um, return us the very same result as before. And on the slide, you can see the query which remains equivalent under both types of logic. And um, uh, a question on this slide is how to get the statistics and the proportion of such queries. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the problem is that we don't have uh, means to uh, getting such statistics, right, reliably, because we uh, uh, don't have, uh, so one, 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 one way to achieve the statistics, right, is to get a random query generator, but uh, these query generators uh, are not available, which we discussed earlier. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, query generator would help us to not only gather the statistics, but also to test efficiency of various queries on various RDBMS, right? RDBMSs are, uh, there are lots and lots of RDBMSs in the SQL world, right? Because uh, there is like Postgres, you may have heard of like MySQL and uh, many, many others. And uh, for all of them, we might want to test efficiency in a consensus way, consistent way. So we want, might want to test efficiency uh, using the same kind of generator, but we don't have this generator. Uh, next slide. And so looking at the existing work, uh, there are some generators available, but they all have the drawbacks, which we will try to solve. Uh, one of them is SQL Smith, which is also written, uh, which is written in C++, and uh, it doesn't capture all the query functionality. It captures basic query functionality, and whenever uh, something that this uh, random query generator outputs doesn't work, it produces an error. Uh, this uh, query generator just uh, trashes this output and it says that, okay, I won't generate such queries. And so basically it does like this uh, try and uh, fail and try again and, and fail again and maybe succeed uh, the other time. And so this is how it uh, generates random queries for uh, Android MMSs in a uh, way that is generalizable, right? Other generators that are available, they are usually only available for a single RDBMS. So they couldn't generate for multiple RDBMSs, so they only generate for a single one. And uh, the last point is that all these, they require you to hard code the parameters, uh, the uh, parameters by uh, according to which the, query, the queries should be generated. And no, not, 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 none of those actually learns these parameters. Next slide. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, the two main requirements for our query generator would be uh, to uh, first uh, be easy to modify and extend for different MDBMSs, and uh, second, to be able to learn from different, different workloads. As you can see on GitHub, only on GitHub, there are 13 million uh, code examples of SQL uh, requests, and so we can train on that. There's, there, there's enough data. Right, and uh, also there are lots of RDB messages, which explains the need to be uh, for this language to be easily extendable for different languages. Next slide. So now we would like to discuss the approach towards creating this uh, generator, and uh, the basic idea of our generator is um, Markov chain. Uh, having said that, we mean that uh, uh, the process of creating our query would uh, include uh, multiple states. And uh, the main idea of the Markov chain is once we are at a certain state, our choice of the next st state uh, is not influenced by the way we came to the current state. Um, so uh, uh, here are two examples, uh, which means that um, um, when, once we are at some state, we have multiple choices. And uh, our decision is based only on the parameters that we have um, at the state we are at the moment. A Markov chain has uh, states which corresponds to the parts of the SQL, as you can see on the first picture. And uh, the second picture just uh, describes the idea that we have multiple choices. We can even uh, return to the very same state at some occasions. And uh, as I said, it never depends on the way we came to this state. Yep. Next uh, slide. Okay, so, yeah, so this is how this looks. So we have two states uh, in our graph and we have uh, handlers for all these states, right? So we have a handler for entering this uh, three values function. We have a, a, a method for exiting this, right? And we write these handlers and uh, just that, just like that and uh, not many lines of code, we can achieve uh, an extension for this graph, which does its own thing and uh, uh, does uh, some work, right? Uh, next slide. Here's uh, one where we are trying to show off a little bit. We are just trying to impress you with some facts of our work, how significant it was, like 2,000 lines of Rust code and uh, other stuff. Huge, weird graph, very massive. Um, yep. Uh, uh, the one uh, advantage of our code is uh, really the ease of change. Next slide. Uh, so uh, this uh, is how the uh, how we add string concatenation, for example, to our uh, graph. This is just we invented like uh, for this project we invented a special syntax for the dot language, which was listed in the previous slide. And in this in the sixth syntax, if you write uh, the graph, uh, you will be able to uh, this the, the our program our parser that we wrote will be able to parse all the states and uh, connect them to the handlers and uh, tie everything together so we have uh, queries generated. Next slide. And so this uh, is a quite of ugly screen of the results of the generated queries. To be explicit, this is an old version of our generator because uh, the latest version is currently in development. Uh, and uh, next slide. Here are some plans for our future work. The first point is that we would like to gather some statistics from real queries on GitHub. Like you see before, there are a huge mass of them and we would like to analyze them to make some uh, summaries on their properties. Another point is that we would like to create a criterion under which um, the query um, behaves in an equivalent way in both uh, two-valued logic and three-valued logic. Another point is we are planning to take a survey on the user preference in which logic to use because there are some cases where query behaves differently and we'd like to know how uh, humans prefer, which logic they seem to enjoy more. Yeah, other, uh, option, other point is improving handler code actually because the code that I have just showed you and in, in the previous slides, it uses handlers. It's okay to use handlers, it's quite convenient, but if you have a lot of states and a lot of handlers, this code gets messy. Like the file with handlers, it is one uh, 1100 lines uh, long. It's very long. And so uh, what we plan to do uh, is to implement, and this is research that we will be continuing um, uh, then uh, after this after this meeting, 
uh, we, we are planning on implementing this uh, in terms of asynchronous logic, right? So you uh, write uh, a graph, and then you have uh, the, sa the same, the same, the same thing, right, basically in your code as you have in your graph. And so this would be a very, very convenient. This would make our code shorter, and so on. And the last thing, uh, the like huge opportunity that you have with Markov chains, because as, as Alexander said uh, before, uh, the Markov chain assumes that like our next state that is does not depend uh, on uh, any state except the previous state, right? So how would we fix that? Uh, maybe uh, there is a there is a possibility because we have a lot of data. Uh, when we have a node and like five exiting age, edges, right? And we have probabilities associated with these edges, and we have learned these probabilities by parsing queries. Maybe we could also condition these probabilities on some parameters. For example, which is the current level of nesting? Like how many queries have we nested already? How many tables have we already used, right? So we input these parameters into a neural network, each individual neural network on each node, right? For each uh, node of the graph. Uh, and this neural network, it predicts the probabilities that uh, the uh, edges should be assigned, right? And so this is how we would achieve dynamic chain weights uh, with neural networks and probably more sophisticated generation and uh, better results. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's uh, ask one question, but very quickly, because <laughs> we're a little bit over time. Bill, please, thank you. Hey, this is really fascinating. Thanks for uh, the presentation. Uh, the current weights in the in the it sounds like there's a there's a bit of a kind of a demo process going on first, and then there's some extensions, different directions to go. In the current generator, where did the weights come from? Were they from uh, real workloads, or were they? Yeah, so uh, in current generator, we haven't trained us yet. So uh, oh, one, one advantage is that we based uh, the uh, abstract, we took the abstract synthetic tree from a uh, parser. So we already have a parser. Uh, we, didn't, we don't have to write that. And when we have a parser and we parse the synthetic trees, we just uh, like traverse them and get the, what the decisions have been made. Like we infer this from the, uh, parse query and so we just uh, place and we train this Markov chain. But currently, uh, in the its current state, we just assigned uniform probability server. So this is uh, uh, this is it's a framework for building kind of a family of generators, perhaps, and you could sort of train it in different yeah. ways, and different assumptions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite a huge project. Yeah, that's why this this is why we we couldn't like finish all of we wanted all of the ideas we wanted to do uh, before this uh, deadline. But it, we, we it, there was like a huge work. Behind this project, and I think that is it's it's really cool, actually. Well, yeah, and, and then just know. maybe just a final comment. You know, I th I think that flexibility is important because you know we, you're back to your original question, sort of reasoning about what percentage of queries in the in a workload are going to end up causing issues with revalued logic. Uh, you know, that's going to be kind of workload dependent, right? So for one company, it might be sort of one percentage, another one for another one. So you you know you you re retrain in different contexts and and sort of uh, you know it seems it seems yeah, like you have a general yeah. code code base that can be used for a lot of different purposes. So very cool. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, and I hear that there may be a paper submission coming uh, out of this work. So this this is great. Uh, let's move on to the next project uh, that Alexandra is going to present on explorable explanations for causal inference. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sandra. I'm a master's degree student in the data science program at Ukrainian Catholic University. And in this summer research program, I worked on explorable explanations for causal inference topic under the kindness mentorship of Joshua, Julia, and Joshua. We have worked on the tutorial interactive article which aims to explain what causal inference is, how it works, and what its mathematical background is. Uh, the article has a cool storyline by Lucia, beautiful picture by Paula, some of which you'll see in the presentation. And it's already been submitted for the workshop on visualization for AI extendability. And my part of the work was to create new and edit existing interactive visualizations, so-called widgets, which purpose to, is to help to see in an interactive way how causal inference works. So what is it? What is causal inference? Uh, causal inference in general is about asking about underlying processes of cause and effect. For example, we may see some outcome and think uh, what caused this outcome. Conversely, we might have some action in mind and think uh, what uh, would the outcome of this action be if we will do it. 
uh, both of these questions are causal questions. Uh, and to this presentation, I've added some widgets and visualizations I worked on, uh, created them or edited them. Uh, so here's one of them. And uh, it shows uh, that as we can see, childcare program uh, causes uh, co cognitive stimulation of a child. And following that, cognitive stimulation causes good test score of a child in some kind of IQ test. Uh, the child care program is uh, the central example of the article, and we'll talk about it more later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. As for the causal questions, readers are, of the article are invited to think about the following questions and think about whether they are causal or not. Uh, now I'm inviting you to think about some of them. So the first question is, uh, does smoking lead to cancer? Is it a causal question? And uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and the answer is yes, it is, because we can rephrase it as is smoking a cause of cancer? Uh, on the contrary, uh, the question among people who smoke does cancer occur more often is not a causal question because we're asking not about whether smoking causes cancer, but the association and some proportion. And actually, the answer to this question won't tell us about the real causal relationship. And the third question is causal again, and uh, the other questions also, because we can rephrase them uh, all into asking about causes. Yeah, so causal questions ask about actions and the effects that those actions might have. And uh, in our article, we consider child care program and together with the researcher, trying to understand whether it has an effect on the test score of children. Ideally, we would like to say whether the test score of an individual child is higher if uh, this child is enrolled in the program than if child is not enrolled. But of course, we can take one child and at the same time enroll it to the program and not enroll. Uh, that's why we consider a large group of children and divide it into the treatment group, which is enrolled in the program, and the control group, which is not enrolled. And the question is, how do we know what that we can consider this group as identical? So here is where randomization come, comes in handy. And the key idea here is that randomization treats everyone the same. It creates a balance between groups and each person has very different characteristics, but he or she is just as likely to get into the treatment group as into the control group. And next slide. And we can see it on this widget. Uh, so imagine we have a population of many people in six categories uh, in different colors and based on the color of the t-shirt they are wearing. If we split our population into treatment and control groups, so the second and third section, uh, using randomization, we can see that the fraction of each short color in each group will be roughly the same. So for example, we can see that most uh, of the t-shirts are still red, and uh, other colors like blue, pink, and aqua, there are very few. In other words, randomization balances short color between the two groups. And if we change the probability of treatment, so we change the um, we, we can change how we divide it into treatment and control group. So next slide. Yeah, and the proportion is still the same. So we can see that the fraction of t-shirts in different colors remains the same among groups. And so we can say that randomization makes treatment assignment independent uh, of all other things that could make outcomes different. Next slide. Yeah, so yeah, we use randomization to create treatment groups and control groups this way. Uh, so, as we said, causal inference is about what causes what, and in the article there are widgets like this, uh, where you can play around with different settings for causal inference, changing the relationships between different variables, types of variables, noise, and so on. And so, the causal inference is about uh, that almost everything is connected, and you should just find some right causal connections and the right causal inference. So thank you so much. Thank you for the attention and thank you for supporting Ukraine. And so don't forget to support and it's still important for us as every day, as for example today we wake up with air raid sirens and air raid attacks all around the country and full scale war is still here and still continues. So thank you for your support. And if you have any questions, it would be a pleasure for me to answer. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, this is excellent work, and uh, this work was already submitted uh, yeah. to a peer-reviewed venue just last week. Uh, questions, please. I, I have one question. Yes, um, Just maybe for anyone curious, 
what uh, technologies or softwares did you use to make these visualizations? Uh, yeah, we used uh, uh, our studio, uh, our widgets, and our models. So it's uh, all it's a big uh, our shiny files with a lot of cool models, and uh, uh, these widgets are implemented on models and connected to the main article. Thanks, and I'll I'll drop a link to the submission in the chat for anyone curious. Uh, it's still under review, but you can take a look and click on widgets. And see how it was it works. Yeah, and if you change your avatars, all the pictures are gonna, or many of the pictures will update. To, and anyway, play with it. It's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Uh, any other? Yes, please, Andrew. Yeah, I have a question. I guess it's like maybe a curiosity, um, but I think one of the big things about explainability is that it's always intended for some human user to try and maybe solve some problem. And I was just curious if you guys had thought about uh, maybe like some use cases or like where you think these kinds of explanations would be most valuable or maybe like what stakeholders might, might be interested in these causal types of uh, explanations. Uh... Actually, what this article is, is more about uh, uh, like a tutorial for users to understand what uh, causal influence is and how it works at all. Yeah, and about stakeholders, uh, as uh, I can understand that causal influence is um, is the thing that is applicable to everything in life. So uh, you always uh, have uh, questions like what are true relationships and what cause what. And for example, like this uh, childcare program we consider. So uh, the question is, is this childcare program have an effect? Uh, and if it have an effect on the test score and so on, cognitive simulation and IQ of, of ch children and so on. So for example, every stakeholder of this childcare program can benefit from like uh, uh, considering true causal, uh, causal relationship, yeah? And uh, if we consider any other thing which causal inference is applicable, their stakeholders are interested in it, of course. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so let's let's go to the next presentation. Uh, and this is going to be on another visualization project, uh, introspection and visualization tools for equitable admissions decisions. Alina and Olga will present. Uh, hello, uh, thank you. So our mentors uh, are Ian and uh, Julia, so thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our project uh, is uh, STEM um, is considering STEM admissions and uh, whether uh, it is uh, equitable decision making. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, so what is STEM? You probably know that it's a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and uh, also it is uh, growing uh, really fast uh, over the past uh, decades. And uh, the problem is that uh, there is an uneven progress in prison race, gender, and ethnic uh, diversity. And uh, we tried to, to see whether uh, there is also this. Uh, uh, this diversity is uh, in this uh, admissions that uh, we had. Next slide, please. Uh, so we collaborated with uh, Summer STEM Rice program uh, on uh, this uh, New York University. Uh, it is a program for high school students uh, and uh, it helps uh, students to work with uh, STEM research opportunities and to uh, uh, we had uh, this data from uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022 uh, that we worked with. Next slide. Uh, so what we did at first, uh, we did uh, exploratory data analysis. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we worked with 2020 and 2022 data because 2021 was done uh, before uh, by Ian. Uh, and uh, like uh, at first, uh, there is uh, just a lot of variables. Uh, for example, uh, you see that uh, most applications were submitted uh, uh, just uh, the day before the deadline. Uh, and uh, like almost nobody uh, applied uh, in advance. Uh, and also you see that uh, the most uh, applications uh, were denied and only a few of them uh, were matriculated. 
uh, and this data is uh, easy to interpret and uh, like easy to work with. But uh, next slide. Uh, yes, uh, some of the data and most of it looked like that. Uh, so these are the schools that uh, applicants are from, and uh, it is hard to understand uh, and interpret it. Mm, and I wanted to remember this slide because we will come back uh, to it uh, later. Uh, so, yes. Uh, during EDA, we next tried to pay attention to different intersectionality patterns. So, for example, on the correlation matrix uh, of the main features, we can see that GPA and decision are not highly correlated, from which we can conclude that grades are not an indicator of applicant success. And also, we can see that families with more education have higher incomes, which is mm, quite reasonable. So, we ask ourselves whether applicants from families with different incomes had the same opportunities and access to resources? And if not, how did this affect uh, outcomes? Uh, to come up with uh, ways to visualize the data distribution and to choose the best one, our team gathered for a design session to decide what exactly we needed to add and uh, what it should look like. Having listed dozens of possible features, we chose the, those uh, uh, most interesting uh, for everyone by voting. And thus we have ensured the availability of work for a long time by doing the most important things first. Next slide. So visualization of uh, intersectionality is quite tricky because the data will be more than uh, two dimensional. And the main task is to visualize the data as conveniently as possible. So for example, an extensive list of uh, zip codes can be represented as pins on the map using different colors for outcomes or returning to the previously mentioned connection between income and uh, um, opportunity. We also sketch different ways to show whether, for example, access to participation in non-NYU STEM programs would depend on family income and whether having such experience affect the final decision. The next part of our work uh, was software development, the most uh, interesting part. Mm. Next slide, please. Uh, so how we managed it, uh, mostly we worked uh, using a uh, Kanban board on uh, GitHub by creating uh, uh, tickets and tasks and uh, distributing who does what. Uh, and um, uh, this looks like that. So we had this uh, success criteria, criteria created uh, branches uh, for each task uh, and uh, also used uh, pull requests when we finished it. Uh, also, we had communication uh, on Slack and uh, multiple weekly meetings. The next slide. Uh, so one of the features uh, is uh, overview and detail page. Uh, here is uh, the visualization of uh, applicants on the overview page. Also, you can uh, look uh, on the more details for each applicant by clicking on it. Uh, and for now it uses uh, dummy data, but uh, soon we will replace it with uh, the real applicant data. Mm, so it uh, visualizes uh, uh, just, uh, for example, this detail page, uh, like family education and uh, income, uh, but maybe we will uh, further uh, some new information here. Uh, the next uh, feature is uh, this uh, school, uh, school list and uh, as i said uh, previously there are a lot of uh, schools that uh, applicants are from uh, so we found some uh, auxiliary data sets with uh, school uh, uh, contact information like website phone number email and location but not all schools uh, have this email and location information uh, and also we found uh, from our uh, initial data set uh, the number of applicants uh, from each school uh, so that uh, people from this arise program can uh, easily uh, work with different schools uh, to make the usage more convenient, we have added such uh, elements as header, footer, and sidebar. Thus, the user can always find the main tabs uh, at the top. Uh, the section he is on will be marked uh, on, on the left, where he can also immediately click to scroll to the necessary part, and uh, all of the essential information and context are at the bottom of the page. 
And speaking of navigation, it is also worth mentioning that some pages can only be seen by authenticated users, so all paths are protected. Uh, finally, data visualization. Since we will need uh, components as by or, uh, bar or pie charts many times and in different variations, uh, firstly, we developed a generic component with simple logic and default flexible settings. And uh, once we had them, we started working on the add-ons on top of them. So for example, one is the graph of the dependence between the school, the number of students and their outcomes. Um, and uh, with the combination uh, of features that Ola mentioned, it can be a helpful tool for looking at the progress of filling out applications and reaching out to schools where the process is slower. Uh, despite what we have already done, many possible steps are still ahead. Uh, next slide. Indeed, uh, in plans we have uh, uh, to get uh, to the bottom of the feature priority list uh, by adding exciting and valuable content. And we are still missing some parts of the data from Arise. So when we will have it, we plan uh, to add the ability to view statistics for previous years, uh, to give the ability to look at the distribution at each step of the completed questionnaire, and uh, to automate the process of adding new data to the system. Uh, and also it will be essential for us to build this tool, not only on our ideas, but also to receive uh, honest feedback from those people who will directly use it. So that way we can improve and develop a beneficial tool. And eventually we're thinking of targeting a paper in CSCW that will describe for coordinated activities in order to reach a common result because uh, our results can be uh, the impetus for something bigger. Next slide. So that's all for now, and thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Right on time, and we do have time for questions, so please. Uh, please, Boris. Yeah, so um, if I might ask, um, during like the whole process of the research, have you found any factors that like, influence heavily the you know, the, the probability of a individual students to actually get to the program, aside from like the high school education level? Right now, I guess no, but we are trying to, uh, for example, with the school feature, we are trying to build the chart that will help like the um, evaluator to look. So for example, this uh, person uh, was uh, of the family with lower income, so maybe, he uh, he has the he has less access to the non NYU uh, programs or something like that. So it may affect uh, their GPA or their uh, other features. So um, yeah, just to look uh, at the bigger picture. I get it. Yeah, thank you. Great. Other questions. So I'm looking forward to seeing how, how this work develops. I think this would be a really nice CSCW submission. If there are no other questions, let's move to the next uh, presentation. And uh, just to checkpoint, we have two more left, this one and then the final one. So we're good with time, but let's keep uh, to 10 minutes. This presentation is about social media content analysis by Boris, Hanna, and Oleg. Uh, yep, thanks for introducing us. So my name is Boris. I've been working with Hannah and Oleg on this project. And um, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, so actually, like the general idea was to, given the starting point where we were at the beginning of the project, knowing that there is like an ongoing war, and that the official position of Russia is that it doesn't wage the war in Ukraine and the use of like the specific word war is kind of prohibited and at some point the we knew that the Russia banned the use of the Facebook and Instagram I guess we are curious uh, about the implications it would have on the spread of the news about the war like in the Russian Facebook segment and we also wanted to understand like the specific of the difference of how the war is talked about 
in Ukraine versus how the war is talked in Russia. And yep. Yes, we were analyzing uh, posts from Facebook and to, to uh, gather We can hear you. Sorry, there's something with your sound. Could you try saying anything again? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Too quiet. Okay, so I can try to walk you through um, the crowd angle part uh, while Hana tries to fix can the mic. Like, it is like very quiet. Like we can hear you, but not to the level of getting the. Yeah, go ahead, Boris. Yeah, so um, to work with the actual, like the, the idea was to work with the posts from the Facebook and to extract some ideas, information. Uh, from the text and the words that were used in those posts. Like one of the hypotheses was that um, in Russian, like information ecosystem, people do not use the word war, but use the word special military operation or whatever. And so the first part was collecting the actual posts from the Facebook, from Ukraine and Russia. And a great tool to do that was um, using the CrowdTangle tool, which is a tool from the Meta, to analyze in posts. And we were able to differentiate between the posts that originate from Russia and from Ukraine uh, by using the inbuilt filters and get the source, like the CSV of the sources that this news originate from. The next slide, please. And we still can't hear you, which is sad. All right, so I'm just going to go through until uh, the issue is fixed, I guess. Um, um, I guess I'm going to present. <laughs> just OK, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, the first problem we had is uh, language detection, because we uh, have to know in what language supposed is written. Uh, because it influences the next steps. Uh, so um, uh, first, we wanted to find the best uh, language detection library, uh, especially that it different, differentiates the best between Ukrainian and uh, uh, Russian. Uh, so we manually labeled uh, 450 posts uh, and uh, divided it into one of the six categories. Uh, and design we tested in uh, the next slide uh, on the uh, different Python libraries uh, uh, and uh, again, the, the best library for our problem is uh, CLD3 uh, because it has the highest accuracy. Uh, okay, what's the next? Uh, then we started working on a classifier that would uh, 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 that would say whether the news is about uh, the war or not. And the, our first choice was a keyword classifier. Uh, so we basically uh, um, made uh, tools with Ukrainian and Russian keywords. Uh, and then we took uh, uh, our messages uh, that we also manually labeled uh, and we uh, and then we preprocessed using this uh, uh, library called PyMorphy2 uh, into the list of words. And if uh, in those list of words was our keywords, then we uh, marked this news as uh, word related. Okay, next slide. Yeah, and another approach to classifying whether the post was actually about the war or not. Um, was to use the embeddings. And I'm going to walk you through like what are the word embeddings at all so that you understand like the background and the context. Um, actually, the idea behind the word embeddings, um, which is a, as far as I'm concerned, a relatively new technique, uh, which was kind of a breakthrough in the natural language processing, is that uh, the idea was that you're able to represent either a single word or like a bunch of words as in a text of the post, as a simple vector, 
like the numerical representation. The next slide, please. And the idea of the vectors is that words that are similar in some like ideological context have similar vectors. And the next, yeah. So, and one of the probably most prominent examples of this was when someone trained a model and they actually find out that if you take a vector of the word kin, you subtract uh, the value of the vector that represents the word man, you add the value that represents the word woman, and you get the queen. And this is done like without without any any background context. So they they just trained the model on like a bunch of text, and the results just just appeared there. Uh, the next slide, please. And then what was important for us in our project using the word embeddings is that if you had the sample text and the comparison text, you you could get the similarity. And I'm really sorry for people who could on read Ukraine and Russian. This is like a really, really basic example. Um, for all other people, um, like <laughs> you see the sample, you see the comparison text. Uh, the idea is that if sentences are similar, you get a relatively high similarity score. And the next slide, please. If the sentences are not so similar, um, you get a score which is like more like zero or something. And the next slide, and get into the actual, the use of the word embeddings is that we actually try to explore the idea of embeddings classifier, right? So we again had labeled the data. We took a sample of 900 posts and for each post we labeled whether we thought um, the post was about the war or not. And then we'd calculate the embeddings of each post compute the similarities between our test and train data. And for each test pose that you wanted to classify, we'd search for the three nearest neighbors. And for example, if you had um, a post which was about sanctions and the post said something about like, Nike is gonna quit Russia because of the sanctions ongoing war. Um, it would say that, wow, this text is actually similar to another text that we classified as war uh, that was saying that McDonald's quit Russia, for example. And so just by using the embeddings, we were able to actually classify pretty good um, the new unknown text. The next slide, please. And the next slide and the next slide and get into the performance of the, our classifier, you could see that um, this is a graph precision and recall. And I'm gonna just, you know, just second walk through. Uh, the precision is how accurately you identify the positives and the recall is how much uh, actually of positives you identify at all. And for the posts, which are from the Ukraine origin in Ukraine, language, uh, you can see the pluses there. Um, that is actually the performance of the keyword classifier. Uh, but next slide. If you move on to the Ukrainian origin Russian language posts, you see that the dots and the dots are just different combinations of train sets. Uh, you can see that actually the dots perform better than the simple keyword approach. And if you move on to the next slide, this is um, the post that are of Russian origin in Russian language. Uh, and the performance is generally worse. And this is like an interesting phenomenon to actually look into because in the dashboards, in the posts that we collected, um, the prevalence of the non-related posts was much, much higher. So the dashboard was imbalanced in the Russian Russian segment, which is kind of expected because they don't talk about the war at all. And I guess there are some steps we wanted to take and wanted to do a little bit more, uh, fine tune the classifier and analyze different statistics, the spread of the posts across the, you know, comparing the war related posts or not. But there's only so much you could do with the limited time and resources. 
And so I guess we could move on to the question answers. We have 50 seconds to do that, I believe. I have a question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, so when you look at the uh, posts in Russian, are these posts originating from Russia? Are you confident in that? Because there is also a you know, large Russian-speaking community outside yeah. of Russia and Ukraine, like in the US, for example. Uh, yeah, the point was uh, the, the way we filtered the posts, um, we only selected the posts that originate either from Ukraine or Russia um, mm -hmm. just by doing that in the crowd tangle when we did the data collection. But we actually differentiate whether the post is from Ukraine, because there are a lot of posts which are written in Russian that originate from Ukraine, which right. is actually pretty common because I live in Kyiv and I spoke Russian before the invasion. Right. So that happened. Yeah. And that's why we had like three charts of the, you know, Russian, Russian, Ukraine, and Ukraine. And then there are posts in Russian that originate from Ukraine. Yeah. I'm, I'm asking, I'm saying that there's more than just these three, right? There is also Russian, not from Russia or Ukraine. I wonder what the properties would be of, of those posts. And then also another question is, does uh, Russia actually attempt to post anything in Ukrainian? Um, it does not happen. We, we looked into that and that just does not happen. Yeah, so they're only interested in propaganda internally, not. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, since they blocked the Facebook, there are just like zero, zero likes on the recent posts. And so the Facebook is more or less dead there. Um, yeah, we tried to explore the possibility of like different origins um, of the post, but there were just a lot of noise in the data. So we decided not to proceed with those dashboards, unfortunately. Got it. Any other questions, anyone? If not, let's move on to the next and final presentation. Last but not least, we will hear about differentially private synthetic data generation for replicating research by Stacy Andri and Taras. Right. Greetings, everyone. My name is Andriy Stadnik, and I, right, I worked on this project with uh, Anastasia and uh, Taras. Next slide, please. Uh, to start, I'd like to uh, tell about the, um, the situation which occurred with Netflix. Uh, some time ago, they put a data set on Kaggle with uh, information uh, of views for different user accounts, and they removed the um rows which uh, the, the columns the information which could uh help to identify uh persons but uh, nevertheless the researchers uh, could link uh, those rows to publicly available data and uh, find information uh, about uh, to which person belongs uh, certain records and hence uh, reveal that information uh, also, Apple used uh, the state-of-the-art approach, differential privacy, to protect uh, data, but uh, researchers claim they, they used it uh, a little bit uh, inappropriately, and hence they compromised uh, some of the data. And uh, with this, uh, we wanted to uh, show that it's really important nowadays to uh, do pro uh, proper data privatizing. Also, you might know that uh, US Census decided to use uh, data, uh, differential privacy in uh, 2020. Uh, year. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, there are different and multiple approaches uh, for data privacy, uh, one of which might be removing private, uh, like uh, identifying uh, information from rows, but as I told you, it doesn't help. Uh, another approach might be uh, to, instead of uh, publishing uh, individual results, to uh, blend uh, them together in uh, so-called buckets of uh, similar uh, records and then uh, publish that data. But it's an uh, NP-hard problem and it suffers from outliers. Uh, there is a different approach, which is called differential privacy, and it's a state-of-the-art uh, approach. Actually, it's a property of an algorithm, but it uh, allows uh, creating uh, also synthetic data sets. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, those, uh, if, if uh, it could be mastered and proven that uh, those synthetic data sets, they possess uh, the same properties or similar enough properties as the original data, it would allow 
the companies to uh, share the, a lot of information they have on our users privately. It would help uh, researchers to publish more reproducible papers. Uh, people would trust surveys more and uh, be more honest. And uh, yeah, uh, and the data sets which were uh, private before they could be published. Next slide, please. Yeah, so let me quickly introduce our research process. So it was split into five general abstract stages. The first stage was to find the highly cited uh, sociology papers and try to reproduce their results on the second stage. The third stage was to run different synthesizers on the original data from the paper and based on it, make the private data. And on the fourth stage, we compared the original and private data and wrap everything uh, up into the CNRD framework. And on the five, fifth stage, we will write a paper and submit it to AAAI conference. Please, next. Uh, OK, so uh, we use in our research three main data sets, mostly about uh, health. And uh, we already worked with uh, eight papers. A lot of them have a serious reproducibility issues, but three were successfully reproduced and synthesized, so I think it's a great achievement. Please, next slide. Let us quickly go through the, our work. So the first step uh, will be described on the, based on the paper related to a depression and suicide risk for football players with ad health data. So the main thing is to read the paper, analyze its methodology, and understand the results and why authors do so. Please, next slide. On the second step, uh, like our best friend was the code book because in the research papers, authors uh, uh, corresponds to different uh, questions in a uh, survey. So, uh, but in data, uh, those questions were uh, coded as, for example, here you can see H1, GH2. So uh, we uh, need to find correspondences and it's a long process, believe me, then process all the values and prepare the common data set. Please next slide. And here is the interesting part, the third step. We uh, wanted to reproduce the tables, figures, and all of the insights. On the upper uh, right corner, you can see the uh, figure from the original paper. And in the bottom, you can see the figure which we were able to reproduce successfully. Please, next slide. Uh, after this, when we reproduce the paper and get the correct results, we use the original data and with some uh, synthesizers, for example, MST, which you can see on this slide, we tried to make a private data and also repeat this uh, process of replication based on the private data and compare it and evaluate. Please, next slide. And the final step was to wrap everything up in Synergy framework uh, to store uh, meta metadata for every paper, so make uh, some features to synthesize, compare, reproduce, experiment, and uh, make some insights from the paper. And it will be very useful for other researchers to reproduce our results and make the decision if some uh, synthesizer is uh, working correctly or not. And now I give the word to Stacey. Thank you, Taras. So um, I, will, I would like to follow you on some of the results that we got for a particular paper. So uh, of my choice, there was a paper which was discussing uh, the demographic predictions and associations with heavy use of marijuana. And this paper was relatively new. It was from 2019 and it was published in a quite a good journal. So next slide, please. So there was a table which actually shows the dynamics and the associations for like the first use of a drug, which was marijuana to anything else. And as we can see here, they presented like a plot uh, for different associations. Next slide, please. So we spent some time to reproduce it. And as you can see, it looks more colorful <laughs> with our reproduction. Uh, so basically, as you can see, the patterns were very alike uh, and actually um, skipping all the mess with the reproduction. So there was only like two thousands of uh, samples data difference because we had some versions of data issue. But next slide, please. So after we tried to reproduce this with the MST paper, we actually got uh, quite a similar plot. And next uh, slide, please. Yes. But to, to show you a closer look, so basically if you compare like the data that was used uh, for uh, this uh, initial data set, you can see that we preserve all of the maximum frequencies 
Uh, and if it looks for you that it's actually the same data, you can see that the frequencies, they slightly differ, but in the end, we're not producing any new samples. We're just like uh, producing the data, which is uh, differential private to the data set that we have. Next slide, please. Yeah, so another uh, table that was showed in this paper, there was all also talking about the associations uh, uh, with marijuana and uh, other uh, classes uh, for the first drug usage. And they actually compared the uh, relative features. So they like they trained the logistic regression and actually calculated the adjusted uh, risk ratio uh, for different features. Next slide, please. So we had a slight issue with that because it was not uh, possible for me to reproduce uh, this kind of result because they usually, like they used an um, inbuilt uh, functions when doing that. So we went for a measure which is kind of closer to ARR, which is just adjusted odd ratio. And as you can see, like when comparing with the data, it gives you the same idea of uh, which kind of classes have a higher risk for uh, their marijuana usage. And this is, was uh, like the initial table. And next slide. The next one was again, the one which was produced with the MST data. And next slide, please. And it was very actually nice to see that here, we, we see that the numbers, numbers are not exact, but you can see that there is slight difference, uh, although all the ranking is preserved. And you can also make the same conclusions like from these two uh, results. And what is more, if you look at the p-value, you can see that all of the features were significant in both, um, in both of the analysis uh, models. Yes, next slide. Yes. So to evaluate like what we have done, so uh, not to repeat myself that we spent a lot of time on paper production. On the other hand, we understand that uh, there is a great of novelty for this work because nobody have done and compared uh, nobody have done this comparison work before. And also uh, there is so we're still defining the evaluation mechanism for our data synthesizers. And next slide, please. And uh, so for the future work and what we are currently working on, on finalizing the framework, and as Tara uh, mentioned, we are going to try to write a paper for triple AI. And there are also more papers to reproduce and to include in this research and also more papers to write. <laughs> um, but thank you for your attention. And we can answer your questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. This is the first time that I saw some of these results, and I'm very excited that the paper is coming together, in fact. Uh, we have time maybe for one question, and then we have a general Q&A for about 10 minutes, let's say. Any questions, folks? Please, Ruslan. Uh, thank you for the, to the team for the presentation. I just wonder what, what are the ways or approaches to make sure that we are not distorting somehow the original distribution, original data. I understand that uh, you try to keep the, the frequency the same, but uh, just my intuition is that, for example, the data may, uh, the distribution may change over time or something like that. Have you thought in that, in that direction or any, any comments? Yes, I can comment on that. So basically our idea was to like take every paper. So we have several and basically each paper is usually stated in one finding. So our idea was not even like to keep the distributions. There was just like the example that I showed for in our case, we're gonna focus on the findings of the paper. And usually like a paper has several findings and we want to make sure that even applying different like statistical methods or machine learning methods will help us to preserve the findings. So that's our main idea. Uh, for example, like in odds ratio, we could see that all the factors were significant and you can actually make the same conclusions as from the like initial uh, data and initial model. Yes. And sorry, what was your second question? I missed it. Uh, yeah, I just was wondering, uh, like, how, are there any approaches to check if we are not distorting uh, when we synthesize the data, if, if this data follows kind of the natural distribution and uh, we are not like, uh, making some different data set from our original data? 
Can I comment on that, Stacey? Yeah, yes. I, I'd like also that, that as far as I understood, that's uh, the important question, which is really hard to answer because the, uh, the synthesized data is uh, different, obviously. And the question is uh, which uh, properties of the data set is preserved. And uh, what we're trying to do is to show uh, on uh, and show using real life data sets instead of toy uh, data sets that uh, different conclusions in real world uh, important papers uh, hold with the uh, synthetic data set. And uh, by that, we hope to prove to researchers that they could use uh, private, uh, differentially private uh, synthetic data sets for their research. Because uh, right now, as far as I know, a lot of them don't, yeah, they are not sure that uh, all the properties holds and it, uh, and hence they are not ready to, to start using it right now in their research. What is your Yeah. All right. So let me just take a moment uh, to take a photo of all of us. Could, could we turn on our cameras, please? Everybody who can, thank you very much. Should have done this at the beginning. We lost some people, unfortunately. But all right, I'll take a few. Ready? <laughs> One more. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, we have five minutes, but we can also uh, stay on a little bit longer if there is interest. So would anybody like to, to chat about anything, ask questions of, uh, of the presenters, anything at all? I have a question for you. Uh, you uh, I wonder whether you have uh, yet considered uh, repeating this uh, research and collaboration with uh, UCU on the next year, possibly, or uh, not yet. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do it, absolutely. And uh, this was a trial run, and I feel like it was a very successful trial run, right? We kind of went into production right away, and uh, things worked out. So I see no reason why, why we wouldn't do it again. And I also would love to continue working with those of you who want to continue working on your projects uh, or even switching to some other projects, right? But we, we have a lot of, I think a lot of papers coming out of this potentially. Six weeks is never enough to write a paper. And I'm really amazed by the amount of pro progress that, that we've all made here. Um, so yes, absolutely. And on that note, do please send feedback uh, my way about what you think worked well, and most importantly, what could be improved? Because when we run this again, and I'm saying when, not if, we want to, to learn from, from this experience. That, that was gonna be my question for the group, I actually. And, and just real quick, you know, thank, since she won't think herself, th thanks to Julie for putting this together in such a, a short amount of time. And with the, the, the amount of heavy lifting behind the scenes is enormous. And I'm sure it's even more enormous than I realized because I've been sort of insulated from it thanks to, thanks to all the work. So this was uh, an absolute joy to be a part of. And I'm, and I, I'm blown away by, the, by the, the results. I was sort of chatting with Julie over the, over the uh, chat about how the presentations are also mature and clear and confident in a way that I try to get my students to try to uh, do after a lot of coaching and so forth. So this is really, really fantastic work all the way around. But maybe one question for the group, if there are feedback about the program or what things we could do better or things that uh, uh, could, could, what went well or any kind of quick takeaways, obviously it's, you know, it's, maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable that to announce uh, to the group, but if there's any immediate thoughts, that'd be great to hear about. or save it for anonymous writing every time. <laughs> and I also want to thank Migna, uh, who's been helping coordinate this presentation and has also been chatting with some of you to get quotes from you so that we can, you know, help publicize and learn from this, et cetera. So thank you, Migna. Yeah, I, I want to give a short feedback. Actually, I was uh, working with Julia and uh, Lucas, Bernice, and you, Bill, and 
there are only positive sides of our communication and uh, the best part was the communication so it was very frequent and uh, we get a lot of feedback on our work so it was amazing thing and uh, i guess there were no negative stuff in our work in our project and uh, i hope that it will continue and we will make the acceptance on triple ai yes so good luck our team and everybody And we should all take a, a short break, uh, you know, either right after this or after the, the papers go in, uh, because this this is intense, <laughs> right? I guess I have a comment, which is like, I think in some ways there's maybe something like publishable just in this process of, of itself and right. or, or just in sharing this process more generally about like what cross collaboration and different time zones looks like how you know the the artifacts that came out of it and like what went well and how it went was i think is like is is in, it's inspiring but also could like help facilitate more of these in other universities that's a great idea let's let's actually brainstorm about this uh I mean, at the very least, we could we could have like a blog post about this, but maybe something better. For sure. Yeah. And we can have a paper that's co-authored by all of us. Right? That would be a nice big group. <laughs> if I may. Of course. I, 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 I agree with Jan uh, that indeed this uh, cross culture, uh, cross country, cross culture collaboration is very important. And uh, I see really good results of that within that short period. Indeed, inspired by the example of uh, New York University and EULA, uh, we, uh, we try now to start similar co collaboration with uh, University of Toronto. And we already talk about the uh, semester-long course that would, would would follow the logic of, of this internship, where there will be a mentors, there will be PhD students from University of Toronto, and there will be students from, from UCU and KU Mohila Academy who will collaborate and during the semester with, with hopefully having, I know, projects, papers, some results at the end. So indeed, uh, I hope it will be a kind of traditional thing now to, to start such kind of collaboration in formal way of having courses, credited courses, uh, not only internships. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for, for doing that and showing us the way. Great, and uh, happy that this is going to continue. We should also talk about... Uh... Yeah. Sure. Of course, I mean, one thing I'll say is that the PhD student mentors, uh, the bulk of the work, right, is 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 with them and this frequency of collaboration, at, uh, of, of communication, etc. So this probably takes, I mean, this is part of people's research also, right, but um, we can do a poll later on, but my guess right now is that this is at least 20 hours of, of work yeah. for each of them, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so being able to actually recruit dedicated PhD and you know, sometimes masters, we have Ian as a master's student, but he, of course, is PhD level. Uh, being able to dedicate, uh, to find dedicated, available PhD students, I think is, is the hardest part here. Uh, so yeah, I'm really happy that that, that my team was, was able to, to carry this. Uh, Thank you. All right. Uh, if if there's anything else, uh, we can, we can continue. I'm I'm happy to continue chatting, maybe over over coffee. Otherwise, let's all be in touch. Uh, and uh, Yaroslav and I will will discuss the logistics for for the next steps in any case, right? Of, of how to continue these particular projects. And uh, yes, please uh, be in touch with with feedback and also with, to express whether you want to stay on. Uh, to continue on these specific projects. I just did, I just wanted to like take a moment to appreciate actually the opportunity to get to work on like the real data with real people on like real tasks. Um, those are pretty pretty nice to do. So thanks.
Yeah, I mean, that's part of responsible AI is actually like working on stuff that matters, right? Today, rather than uh, somehow abstractly maybe of interest, which is also important, right? But um, this is sort of our brand. Yeah. Okay, so I, I don't want to keep us longer than, uh, than we want to be online because uh, we want to end on a high note. So thank you everybody once again, great work. Uh, and I'm sure that we will all be in touch. Thank you, bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, see ya. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.